So welcome to the first week of the Wellbeing Virtual Series. My name is Melanie Gertis. I'm the licensed counselor on campus for Victoria College, and we have Katie with Mid Coast Family Services to do uh, the presentation on what's in your cup, Alcohol 101. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can y'all see my screen, Melanie? Yes. Okay, what's in your cup? Alcohol 101. So, like she said, my name is Katie Fulmer. I work with Mid Coast Family Services in the um, youth program. So, we work um, in prevention, first grade through eighth, I mean, through high school. And then we also do like the adult population. So, we're a local nonprofit here in Victoria. Okay, so what is alcohol? Alcohol is formed when yeast breaks down the sugar in foods without the oxygen. Um, alcohol is considered a depressant, which means slows down the function of your brain. And in the state of Texas, our um, legal drinking age is 21 still. So that is what the definition of alcohol is, okay? So there's different kinds of alcohols out there. Not all of them are the same. So you have your beer, your standard beer, you have your malt liquor, so your um, different type of malt liquors, the um, alcohol level in those, you have your wines, and then you have just your straight um, spirits, which are like your vodkas, your rums, and stuff like that. So those are all considered alcohol. They just have different levels of alcohol in them, okay? So what is a standard drink? So you think of, oh, I'm only going to go out and have one drink, or, oh, I'm not that drunk. I only had three drinks. Well, if I had my three drinks is not the same as the same three drinks that the table next to me had at a restaurant. So one standard drink is considered a 12 ounce beer. So a small beer, um, eight to nine ounces of a malt liquor. So if you're thinking about like, um, some of the like seltzers and stuff like that, it's like pretty much like two standard drinks are in one of those tall cans, um, five fluid ounces of wine. So that's like Depending on the size of your wine glass, it's not, doesn't look like much wine in your glass. That's the standard drink. And then 1.5 ounces of a shot of, you know, your gym run tequila. So sometimes when we're drinking um, alcohol, we think, oh, I only had one drink. But in reality, you know, we filled our wine glass to the top or we, you know, had a tall boy beer or something like that. So really we had maybe two or three standard drinks in that one. So we kind of start to confuse ourselves thinking that we're not drinking as much as we really are. Okay. So what are some of the short term effects of drinking alcohol? And y'all can put those in the chat if you would like. If not, we could just go on. What are some short term effects that y'all know of, of drinking alcohol? And if anyone, or you can say it out loud. If anyone chats, Miss Melanie, if you could just tell me because I can't see him because I'm sharing. Someone posted headache. Another person posted feeling bloated. Yes, those are all perfect things. So some of the short-term effects, those are two very common ones. Um, so your slurred speech. Um, that's one of the main wins that we notice whenever we're around people that have been drinking alcohol, like they start to slur their speech. That's one of the most common side effects of alcohol when you're drinking. Um, impaired judgment, decreased perception and coordination, um, vomiting, headaches currently or in the morning if you get a hangover, um, breathing difficulties, risky behaviors, loss of consciousness, mood swings, um, and you can black out. So those are all some short term effects of alcohol use. So think about the people that you may know or surround yourself with when they start to drink, what are some of the first things that you notice that they do? Everybody's different. Everybody has a different tolerance, but you're going to have some type of effect from drinking. You may have one effect one day and then the next time you drink, you have a different effect. It changes based off of how much you're drinking, what you're drinking, the time of the day that you're drinking, what other emotions you're feeling, or if you're tired or you're you know, emotional or whatever, all those things kind of affect how the alcohol is going to affect your brain and what else is going on. Okay. So some of the long-term effects 
are, you know, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, liver disease, and digestive problems. Um, you know, not only cancer of the liver, but cancer of the breast, mouth, throat, esophagus, and colon. Um, it definitely gives us a foggy brain, learning and memory problems. Um, it can definitely ties into mental health problems like depression, anxiety, um, can be triggered by that, can be caused by that, social problems to so where we also we think we only have to be around people if we're drinking or I can only go to this party if I have a drink before I go. Um, and then alcohol dependence um, is a final long-term effect. So you just become dependent of it. So, you know, when you think of alcoholism, a lot of different things come to your mind is what's a long-term effective and people just think, oh, they become an alcoholic. But not only does it affect your liver, but it also can affect all these other parts of our, our bodies and how these other um, effects on us long-term, okay? So alcohol in our brain. Um, alcohol decreases some of the activity in the prefrontal cortex. This area helps you think clearly and rationally and is involved in your decision-making skills. So that's why those short-term effects showed, you know, the decision-making skills and all that stuff. So once it gets into our, it gets to our brain, that's why it starts to make that prefrontal cortex, you know, kind of blurry a little bit. And then that's why our decision-making skills start to change. Um, alcohol increases levels of dopamine in the brain that creates the high or the buzz. So, you know, when you've had a few drinks, you start to kind of feel it a little bit, you know, you start to feel maybe happier, you start to feel a certain kind of way, that's the dopamine in our brain releasing um, and making us feel that way. And then alcohol reduces the functions of the behavioral inhibitory centers in the brain. How you process information is delayed. It makes it harder for you to determine what you are feeling. It makes you less likely to think through potential consequences. So, you know, um, if you've ever been under the influence of alcohol, you know, sometimes when you've had a few drinks, you start to just think you could do everything, you could do anything, no one can stop you, you're not, you're invincible. Um, and that's because, not just because you drank a few beers, or you had a shot, or you had a margarita, um, that's because, you know, your brain, that's what your brain's telling your body to do and how to react. So other areas of the body affected, so, um, infect, affected, sorry, um, your liver, digestive system, your pancreas, your heart, your bones, um, all of that is affected long term by the alcohol because all of the your you know your liver stops to starts to stop processing all the toxics out of your body and then it just really starts to affect every other part of your body. So that's why you know we really try to get everyone to understand that you know the prevention side of it that you know don't start because you could start as a social drinker and then you just kind of start. Now I drink every other day and now I drink every, you know, every day and now I'm dependent on it. And then it's just going to eventually break down your body, um, which is really not good. We don't want that to happen with any kinds of drugs or alcohol. Okay. So college and alcohol. So how does this um, benefit y'all, right? So alcoholistic drugs and tobacco use are way more common among young adults than in any other age group. So, you know, mixing them together, um, using them single by themselves, it's the usage gets a lot higher in college. You know, you move out of your parents' house, you, you know, go out on your own, you're exposed and you experiment with a lot more people. And that's how it, um, you just start to experiment with it. So that's why we try to get the information out there. So you can see that, you know, everybody's doing it kind of thing, but you just have to be educated on it. Um, two out of five adults were, were, were binge alcohol users and about one in every 10 are considered heavy alcohol users. Um, one in four use an illicit drug in the last 30 days and one out of seven have needed substance use treatment. So um, like I said, it starts off as a social thing and then before you know it, you're needing some kind of treatment. Okay, so how much is too much? So how much is too much for us to be using? What is considered heavy alcohol use? So for men, consuming 15 or more drinks per week is considered heavy alcohol use. And for women, for us, it is eight or more drinks per week. So if we're drinking eight or more drinks per week, that's a Sunday through a Saturday, then that's considered heavy alcohol use. So that's eight of those standard drinks that I talked about at the beginning. So that's not eight bottles of wine or, you know, 
eight of the white claw trulies or whatever that is eight standard drinks so you know that could be depending on your glasses of wine that could be just three or four glasses of wine so you have to think about you know am i a heavy alcohol user and i didn't even know you know i thought i was just drinking standard but is it considered heavy so that's what he um heavy alcohol uses and then same thing for men 15 or more drinks a week well if you're drinking the 20 ounce beers, well, then you're getting almost like one and a half servings in each one. So you have to think about that. Um, how many drinks is considered binge drinking? So binge drinking is whenever you just drink as much as you can until you black out, pass out. You know, binge drinking is you're doing it to get drunk, you know, to black out and that stuff. So binge drinking five or more in a single occasion for men and four or more for women. So if you go to a party or you go to a restaurant and you all you're worried about is drinking and how much you can drink and how fast you can drink then that is considered binge drinking um and anything over five is considered binge drinking for the men okay so you know you think about going to parties or anything like that do people drink more than do you see men drinking more than five drinks in a span of two or three hours most of the time yes right um so it's just bringing that awareness okay so indicators of risky or excessive drinking. So, you know, if you like to have an occasional drink and you're of age, then, you know, that's okay. You're of age. But how do you kind of start to realize yourself some of the indicators um, and of you're being excessive? So do you drink more or longer than you attend, intend? So, you know, do you go out for one drink, but then you have one drink or you have two and then you go home and you end up drinking all night until you pass out, right? Um, do you try to cut down or stop drinking, but you're unable to do so? Do you say, okay, I'm not going to drink this weekend, but then your friend's like, hey, do you want to go out with me tonight? And you're like, yes. Like, it's hard for you to say no. Um, you have to drink more than, more than once to get the effect that you want. So you used to be able to have one or two drinks and you'd be fine and content and be able to, you know, go to sleep. But now those two same two drinks don't do nothing for you. You need four or five or six, Right. Um, you continue to drink even though it makes you feel depressed or anxious or adds another health problem. So it starts to make you mad. You start to, you know, get anxious. It starts to make you sad, but you still do it even though you don't like the way it makes you feel. Um, your loved ones or other trusted friends have made comments about your drinking pattern. So people notice. Um, people will notice that, you know, you're the one always coming to the party and you have a beer in your hand or you're the one that always comes with a six pack. So if people become them, it starts to kind of be a problem and they notice it, that it's becoming your habit, they will start to make comments, especially your family and your friends. Um, you spend a lot of time drinking or thinking about alcohol. Um, you always think about, okay, when I get off of work, I'm going to go to the store whenever I can't wait to get off of work and go home and have a ice cold beer, whatever you spend time thinking about it. If you're, you plan it, it's a part of your day. Um, finding that drinking often interferes with daily activities, family, friends, or work. Um, so you're not going to the kid's birthday party unless there's some type of alcohol, alcohol there. Or you don't want to go to this event because it's a dry party, meaning that there is no alcoholic beverages served. So you um, only want to do things if there's alcohol involved. If we're going to be drinking, I'm there. But if we're not, mm, I don't want to go. That's definitely an indicator of excessive drinking. And then, of course, if you've been arrested or had any other legal problems due to drinking, that is a huge um, indicator, especially if you continue to do so. So, you know, um, in the state of Texas, we have a, our DWI laws are very strict. We have a zero tolerance policy most of the time. So we, you know, if you get pulled over and you're under the influence and you're over the legal limit of alcohol usage, which I believe is like 0.08, um, then you'll get a DWI and that's like, you know, $10,000, $15,000 worth of fines and community service and interlock systems placed in your car. So if you get one of those and you continue to drink, you know, that's definitely an indicator. And then experience symptoms of withdrawal when you don't drink. Um, some of our withdrawal symptoms include sweating, uh, tremors, headaches, anxiety, irritability, and insomnia. So if you start to have withdrawal symptoms, then um, you should definitely seek help from a counseling department or outside counseling or anything like that, um, because that is definitely an indicator. So it starts off that 
you drink at the start of our list, you just drink more than you intend it. So you have four drinks instead of two and you're, you know, you're feeling kind of drunk versus just buzzed. And then you end up that you're, you know, you go through all those steps and at the end you end up with some kind of withdrawal symptoms. And that can happen so fast for us because our brains are not fully developed until we're 25 or 26 years old. So that our brain likes that alcohol and likes that extra dopamine that it's getting so that it just constantly is wanting it. So that's all you're thinking about. So that's how it ties in to the brain and the excessive drinking. Okay, let's see. So tips to cutting back are if you just want to stop cold turkey in general. So monitor your alcohol use, set a daily and weekly drinking limit, uh, write down your limit and keep with it. So, you know, alcohol is expensive. So if you want to say, I'm only going to spend $30 a week on drinking or $20 a week on drinking and that's your limit and you use it in one day, well, then you hit your limit, right? Um, set a limit, tell somebody about it so that, you know, so you have someone to hold you accountable for it. Pace your drinking, have no more than one standard drink per hour. So, you know, pace yourself. If you're going to be at a party all night or you're going to be in an event all evening, you know, pace yourself. It's not a race to see who can drink the most, the fastest, you know, record how much you drink each day, avoid situations that trigger you to drink. So, if you know, when you hang out with this friend, he always wants you to drink until you just get passed out drunk, then make an excuse. Don't go hang out with them anymore. You know, stay away from those situations. Um, hang out with people, ask a friend who doesn't drink to help you stay within your limits. So, you know, find those groups of people that do other things besides using alcohol to have fun to, you know, hang out with them. And if you need to, you could speak to your doctor or seek treatment for your alcohol use. So, you know, you could always talk to your family doctor or counselor or anybody about it, and they can kind of help you with different resources that are available out there. Okay. Your liver can metabolize about one standard drink per hour. So consuming one beverage per hour can lead to intoxication without you even realizing it. So our liver, on top of everything else that it does for our bodies, can only metabolize one standard drink. So one 12 ounce of beer is all it can handle filtering out every hour. So whenever we start to put all this excessive um, alcohol into our body, that's why when we wake up the next morning, we're so thirsty, like our liver's trying to catch up, right? Um, so you have, that's why you have to, if anything, that's why you have to pace yourself is because you need your liver to function and you want your liver to be able to do its job and you don't want to, um, you know, mess it up or destroy it by drinking so much. So that's why, you know, alcohol, um, alcoholics or recovering alcoholics, a lot of them have cirrhosis of the liver or a liver transplant or, you know, all these liver issues because over the years, they've just you know, have consumed so much alcohol that their liver now just can't keep up anymore. Like it's just has constantly been trying to metabolize all of the drinks and all the alcohol that it's, they've consumed over the years that now their liver can't do what it's meant to do. And that's filter out all of our normal bodily fluids and stuff like that. Right. So think about how much, you know, even if you got to eat at a restaurant or, you know, you just have two small margaritas or two drinks that's more than a standard drink. So your body's trying to catch up. So think of your body trying to do that every single day or three times a week or however much you're drinking, how much you're drinking and how hard it is for your body to, you know, um, keep up with the amount of drinking and for your body to still do what it's supposed to do with just the normal food and drink that we put in our body that's good for our bodies, right? Okay, so these are some numbers um, by college students. So um, according to the 2019 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, 52.5% of full-time college students ages 18 to 22 drank alcohol in the past month, and 33% of them engaged in binge drinking in the past month. So over 50% of college students are having some type of alcohol drink every month, right? Um, again, binge drinking is defined as five or more drinks on an occasion for men and four or more for a woman. Uh, for a typical adult, the pattern corresponds to consuming five or more drinks or four or more drinks in about two hours. In addition, 8.2% engage in heavy alcohol use, 
Um, these binge drinkers and heavy alcohol user rates are both higher than for those not attending college. So being in college automatically puts you at a higher risk to becoming a binge drinker or heavy alcohol user um, just because you have access to it. So um, there's been 1,519 deaths, um, 696,000 assaults, a 33% engage in binge drinking, one in five college women experienced sexual assault during their time in college where alcohol was involved, and a majority of sexual assaults in college involve alcohol or some kind of other substance, right? So um, that is kind of the same information right there. So um, the main one is the sexual assault. So, you know, when you're thinking about like going out to bars and, you know, being out with other people that you don't know. So although estimating the number of alcohol-related sexual assaults is exceptionally challenging since sexual assault is typically underreported, researchers have confirmed a longstanding finding that one in five college women experience sexual assault during their time in college. A majority of sexual assaults in college involve alcohol or other substances. Researchers continues in order to better understand the relationships between alcohol and sexual assault among college students. So you know, if you got to a bar and they slip something in your drink and then, you know, you get roofied, you black out, they take you somewhere, you know, you wake up the next day, you don't know what happened. So that's, you know, where it ties into because that alcohol doesn't, um, it mess, you know, it's messing with your, your brain and it's messing with your response and you're not really paying attention to your drink like you should. So, you know, when you're going out in public and drinking, you have, if you have a drink in your hand, don't put it down. Don't leave it with anybody. If you go to the bathroom, take it with you. Um, you know, if you do let it get out of your eyesight, don't drink it anymore. Get a new drink um, because, you know, you just never know who's watching you, who can slip something in your drink that, you know, people are watching you drink and how much you've had to drink. And they know that you kind of become, um, you know, you're relaxed a little bit more and they see that. So then they come in and they try to, you know, slide in and talk to you and then they can slip something in your drink. It happens that fast. And um, a part of Midcoast Family Services, we do um, sexual assault, like a SART. And we actually often will go out from calls from our local bars for the same thing for someone getting roofied. And then the next day, the girl, um, the female wakes up and, you know, she was involved in a sexual assault at a bar. So it ha it's happening in our area. It's not just stuff that you see on the news or you see on the internet or social media, like it's happening in our area. So you have to be very aware of your surroundings when you go out um, and drink alcohol and also watch your friends too. And, you know, guys can get roofy too and guys can have something slip, um, slip into their drink. So you always have to be very aware of your surroundings when you're Anytime that you're drinking, but definitely when you're out in a public place where you don't know everybody there. Um, some alcoholic, con I'm sorry, academic consequences. About one in four college students report academic consequences from drinking, including missing classes, falling behind in a class, doing poorly on exams or papers, and receiving lower grades overall. So that's just calls from, you, know, you like to go out and you like to go to the college night and you like to go out and party and do that stuff. Well, yeah. Of course, you're not going to go to class on a Friday or a Thursday if you went out on a Wednesday. So, I mean, that's an easy statistic to believe because, you know, we fall into the, oh, it's so fun and I like the way it makes me feel. And we don't see how the consequences are going to affect us. And college is expensive. We got to go to our classes and pass for sure. So let's see. So how can you help someone? So what if you're like, none of this applies to me. Um, but I want to help somebody like I know someone this applies to. I know someone that's a heavy drinker. I know someone that, you know, is a borderline alcoholic. I know someone that always shows up to the party and has a case of beer with them. Right. How can you help someone? So you can talk with your peers, students, family members about the dangers of harmful and underage college drinking, such as the possible legal and school pen penalties, um, the risk of alcohol overdose, unintentional injuries, violence, unsafe sexual behavior, academic failure and other adverse consequences. So just talk to them. Um, after you've talked to them, you can reach out periodically and keeping the lines of communication open while staying alert for possible alcohol related problems. So sometimes you have to love people from a distance and you have to just tell them and 
most people aren't going to like that you're calling them out because they're drinking too much, right? Um, but after that, just kind of check in on them, watch their, you know, watch their motion, see what they're doing, see their actions, see how they're reacting. Um, you know, res remind students, remind your family members to feel free to reach out to them to share information about their daily activities and ask to help if needed. So the more you check in on them, they kind of start to notice like, okay, she's on to something. She's checking in on me a lot. She knows something's not right. You know, she's, she is noticing and she's checking. Um, and then for your school, you know, learning about the school's alcohol prevention and emergency intervention efforts, as well as the school's policies and procedures in place to fall um, for the coronavirus pandemic. So, you know, with COVID and alcoholism, a lot of people did start drinking. Um, so, you know, how does it tie together? There's so many resources out there because of COVID-19. So you may have some resources on your campus or at your doctor's office or the local health department that you're able to use that can help you or your family member or your peers that can help you, you know, get some help with your alcoholism if you suffer from it. And then make sure students know the sign of alcohol overdose or alcohol related problems and how to help. So um, coming from a prevention background, mainly what we do, you know, we just, if you have kids, if you have grandkids, you know, that are even in junior high, all the way up through high school, you know, really start to talk to them about alcohol and how it affects them because it, the sooner you start to get the message across to them, the better off they're going to be. And, you know, there's junior high kids that are sneaking alcohol onto campuses these days. So you really want to make sure that you're very aware of when you're at parties with your family and stuff like that, like make sure none of the kids are sneaking alcoholic drinks or stuff like that, because they're, bodies can't handle that. And it, that's how, you know, alcohol overdose and blackouts and all that stuff happens. So you have to be very aware, even if you've never had an alcoholic drink in your life, you probably know someone that does become um, very dependent of drinking alcohol. So you have to um, be aware of your surroundings and, you know, how you can help somebody. It's hard and it's scary to reach out to people like, hey, I think you're drinking a little too much. But as soon as they know that someone's aware of what they're doing. They will change their behavior, ask for help, or get mad at you and hide it. But at least you did your part and reached out to them and tried to help them, right? Okay. Okay, so now we're going to assess your alcohol use. So this is like three little questions. Um, you could just write down like one and then A, B, C, D, or E. And then at the end, I'll give you your score, okay? So how often... Do you have a drink containing alcohol? And if you don't want to write it down, you want to put it in the chat, you can definitely do that. Or you could just write it down for your own personal notes. So how often do you have a drink containing alcohol? So that can be anything from a shot, a beer, a glass of wine, um, a margarita, anything. So never, monthly or less, two to four times a month, uh, two to three times a week, or four or more times a week. And your week is Sunday through Saturday. Now, how often do you have a drink containing alcohol? Okay. Let me move on to the next question. How many standard drinks containing alcohol do you have on a typical day? So on those days that you're drinking, are you just having one or two, um, three or four, five or six? seven to nine or you're having 10 or more you're binge drinking you're going all out and you're having 10 or more so which one do you have the most of okay and then how often do you have six or more drinks on one occasion never less than monthly, monthly, weekly, daily, or almost daily. So how often are you having six or more drinks? Okay, so here's your results. So if you've got A, it's zero points. Um, B is one, C is two, 
D is three and E is four. So how many points do you have? So men, uh, four points or higher is considered is considered hazardous drinking. So if you're a male and you have four more points and you, it's considered hazardous drinking. For women, uh, three points or more is considered hazardous drinking for us. So add up your points, see how many points you had. Okay, did everyone get their points? Okay, so we are Midcoast Family Services. We are located at 111 South Liberty Street, so downtown Victoria. Um, we're about to move to North Navarro by Double Dave's Pizza, so we'll be moving next week. Um, we do youth programs. We do sexual assault, family violence, homeless prevention, um, we have our thrift stores in town. The one downtown is currently on a moving cell. Um, then we have our other one on Sam Houston. Um, we take donations there. And then also all of the funds that we make at that store also stay within the community. So we are an agency that has um, all different resources for all different things that are going on in people's lives. So changing lives every day. But that is all I have. Let me see. Stop sharing my screen. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? I'm going to stop recording now.